11.02 Eastern Time, a very good morning, good evening to everyone present today. Uh, welcome again to the second webinar hosted by the Euroimmune Academy. I'm Aishu Venkat and it's a, my pleasure to welcome you all to the second episode of the Neurology Webinar Series. And today's topic is clinical evaluation of autoimmune encephalitis with antibody positive and seronegative cases. That would be our discussion today, and this will be presented by Dr. Robert Kaddish as our first speaker. Following his presentation, we'll have once again Dr. Nades, who will address the key technologies used for detection of various neuroimmunology markers. And he will also talk how Euroimmune has been successfully identifying some unknown or novel autoantibodies in this condition. Similar to our last presentation, our last webinar, we'll have a panel discussion uh, where you can ask your questions to the speakers. So for that, please type your questions in the chat box. We'll be continuously monitoring them. And all questions that have been typed in the chat box will be relayed to our speakers and they will answer them towards the end of our discussion. In case your questions have not been answered or if you have a question at a later time point, please send us an email at scientificaffairs at euroimmune.us and we'll be happy to forward them to our speakers who can then answer them, uh, answer to your questions. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you all Dr. Robert Kaddish as our first speaker. Dr. Robert Kaddish is an assistant professor of neurology at the University of Utah in the Division of Neuroimmunology. His clinical focus include autoimmune neurology, neuroimmunology, general neurology, and the use of technology and diagnostics in these conditions. He sees patients, those that include multiple sclerosis, neuromyelitis optica, neurosarcoidosis, as well as autoimmune encephalitis. Throughout his career, he's taken a special interest in training education, as well as uh, excited to continue this trend at the University of Utah, where he's the Associate Director for the Neurology Medical Student Clerkship. He's designed and implemented a structured neuroimmunology and autoimmunology, uh, autoimmune neurology curriculum for neurology residents at University of Utah. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaddish. It's a pleasure to have you as our second speaker of our webinar series, and it's the first speaker for today morning. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for that great introduction, and I'm honored, really, truly honored to be here today and very happy to see that so many people from a, are here, you know, truly from an international crowd. So I want to thank Dr. Ben Kotterman and the Euroimmune team for having me here, like I said. Also, shout out to the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance, who are doing a great job advocating for the patients. And, uh, you know, we, we have a, a very broad audience today. So we have clinicians, we have laboratory scientists, and of course, we have patients in the, in the audience for, you know, whom we do all of this. You know, this, this is very important, and I'm happy that we could have the patients here today. So we're moving at a very blazing speed of discovery in this field. And I'll show you that as we go through these slides. If you haven't seen a prior, uh, the prior presentation by Dr. Piquet, you should also check that out. I believe that will be uploaded um, later. So just quickly disclosures, I do receive research funding from Lexion Pharmaceuticals, not related to this talk for uh, specifically for NMOSD, for which I will not be talking about today. And I am an employee of the University of Utah. So here's my beautiful home. Autoimmune neurology, which autoimmune encephalitis, I think, falls under the bin or under the umbrella of, is exciting, rewarding, but also confusing, I do admit. Uh, and I think it's my goal today to dispel some of that confusion in the realm of autoimmune encephalitis. More and more, the unknown is becoming known. So here is a basic frame of what we are gonna talk about. Autoimmune neurology deals with many things, as you can see, um, but we are gonna be focusing more on autoimmune encephalitis, where a subcategory would be perineoplastic in non-perineoplastic conditions. And in general, I want to make a delineation right from the start because this is very important 
to what we're going to be talking about throughout the presentation. Autoimmune neurology, of course, deals with the body attacking itself or not working with itself correctly. And in that manner, autoimmune encephalitis has to do with antigens uh, that are presented to the nervous system. So foreign material that is presented to the central nervous system and that reacts with the immune system, causing the immune system to attack itself. So this is a case of hysteria of the immune system. And so on, on the left, so I want to make a delineation right down the middle. On the left, we are gonna be talking about encephalitis associated with cell surface antigens or synaptic antigens. In any case, extracellular proteins or antigens. You could see that in the picture here, the little red dots outside of the neuron. And this is how a staining pattern would look. On the right, contrast that with encephalitis associated with intracellular antigens. As you can see, the little yellow circles there are the intracellular antigens. And this is somewhat of a different process, we think. And here's a, here's a staining pattern that looks a little different as well. So let's, let's go ahead and discuss how these processes are different. So cell surface antigens or extracellular antigens now, some of the ones that you may have heard of are NMDA receptor encephalitis, LGI1, GABA-A. Certainly, there are many more. In general, these have a variable cancer relation, and many times these can be related to post-infectious uh, antigens, perhaps, or in, in many times, it's actually unknown. Um, this is a primary antibody response. And the treatment response is good. I put a little asterisk there because not everything is absolute in this field as we fi will find out, but in general. Contrast that to the intracellular antigen-based conditions, which have been classically called perineoplastic conditions. These are the ones associated with Hu, Yo, Ri, Ma, et cetera, autoantibodies. These are many times associated with cancer, and the primary response is one of a T cell base. Not that there is not a B cell portion to it, but it's frequently a T cell base in the autoantibodies are less frequently described to be directly pathogenic. Um, and the treatment response frequently is poor. So this, this is an area of great need for additional research as well. Now, I, I'll have throughout the presentation various red blocks that you'll, you'll see pop up, and these are clinical hints or things I want you to take away. Now, in the case of intracellular antigens and autoantibodies related to these, these may develop up to two-thirds, in up to two-thirds of cases prior to an actual cancer being found. Like I said, this field is very much a not black or white field. And I have this Venn diagram to illustrate. So there are different uh, antigens, autoantibodies here. And we mentioned some of the classical perineoplastic ones, such as amphiphysin, CV2, HU, MA. These are very often associated with a cancer. However, some of the ones that are cell surface or extracellular sometimes are not associated with a cancer. And then you have, as a, for example, LGI-1. In, in that, that one particularly, in many cases, is not perineoplastic. However, when you look at the NMDA receptor uh, autoantibody, there is a um, link to ovarian teratomas. So, you know, this is a very not black and white field. In neurology, we also like our diagnostics or our tests to try to clarify what is going on. And part one of those tests is getting spinal fluid, cerebrospinal fluid, and looking at it and seeing what the composition is. Now, this figure here it actually looks at many different studies, uh, a meta-analysis of sorts, a systematic review, looking at different uh, spinal fluid compositions with different 
autoimmune encephalitis. So for example, LGI-1, inglon, glycine, et cetera. And the number up here represents uh, the number of studies that were looked at. So for example, LGI-1, you see it has a very big white portion, white bar, which is normal. So in many cases, this spinal fluid in LGI-1 autoimmune encephalitis is normal. However, in NMDA receptor encephalitis, the spinal fluid is almost never normal. And other diagnostics that we like to use in neurology include the MRI of the brain, the EEG, and then of course, looking at structural imaging of the body and metabolic imaging of the body to see if there are any associated cancers. Now for MRI, we have noted that there is a variable sensitivity. For example, for NMDA receptor encephalitis, it's relatively low. Whereas for LGI-1, it is higher. The EEG or a brainwave scan many times is insensitive and gives us information that we're not quite sure what to do with. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it, but we need to know the pitfalls of it. Um, the structural imaging, which is the computed tomography or, or CT, uh, is many times combined with the PET, which is a metabolic study, and that may increase sensitivity, uh, especially when done, well, first of all, when done looking at the brain and looking for temporal lobe abnormalities, that may increase the sensitivity. Um, and then when looking at the body and adding the PET to the CT, that also may increase the sensitivity. Now, these tests are not without their caveats though, which we'll discuss shortly as well. Another important thing for clinicians is to stay up to date with medicine and general neurology. That's because conditions that mimic autoimmune encephalitis are various. And this is just a relatively short list. I'm sure everyone could add more to that as well, but we need to stay on our toes. So despite advancements in the field, a high suspicion and early empiric treatment are still key to this field. So let's, let's discuss a little bit of history and perspective in the field before we go further. Now this is in neurology, one of the newest fields of special specialty, uh, one of the newest specialties. Um, however, work has been ongoing for a very long time. Even in the late 1800s, there was suspicion of this spooky uh, action at a distance type thing where the cancer did not directly cause a, um, a symptom, but indirectly it somehow did. And these clinical reports kept on trickling in and later into the late 1900s, very clear, um, very clear neurological syndromes were found, including subacute sensory neuron neuronopathy with lung cancer, which would later become anti-Q. So the discovery in this field, autoimmune encephalitis, has been staggering. Since the 80s, a lot of the discovery focused on intracellular antigens, the classical perineoplastic conditions. And after the later 2000s, a lot of that focused more on the extracellular uh, antigens. And this, this is uh, important to know because, again, we should not forget about the perineoplastic conditions because they still exist. However, some of the research into that has slowed. To also give you some perspective about how common these conditions are, right? So we, we all think of these conditions as perhaps rare, but we also, know that we also are talking about these more and more every year. So for example, among in a study for, in the California Encephalitis Project, when they looked at the spinal fluid and serum of, of, uh, from patients less than 30 years of age, they found that anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis accounted for more cases than HSV, West Nile virus, and varicella virus combined. Then later in 2018, the, it was noted that the prevalence and incidence of autoimmune encephalitis is comparable to infectious encephalitis, and we're getting better at detecting it. So I, I, I would argue this condition is not as rare 
as we once thought. Now, it is very difficult, I will, I will go ahead and say it is very difficult to diagnose this condition and keep up with the staggering rate of discovery. That's because the clinical presentation does not always predict a specific antibody. So we like, you know, in, in life in general, we like test A that leads to diagnosis A. That, that is very not much not what's going on in autoimmune encephalitis. So symptoms can overlap between different autoantibodies. So this is a point I wanna make from this early slide is that we need to have a panel-based testing system because we can't specifically predict an autoantibody. There are some exceptions to this. Uh, Dr. Piquet in her presentation presented uh, LGI-1 encephalitis, which had the classic facial brachodystonic seizures. That is a relatively pathognomonic finding. However, I would say mostly it is very difficult to predict a specific autoantibody. Okay, so what we have then, even though we have our fancy tests, now we know that there's some limitations. What we do have is our time-tested means of clinical evaluation. And uh, I, I would say in neurology in general, the history gives you the answer 80% of the time. My mentor, Stacey Clardy, actually noted that this could be up to 90 or 95% in the case of autoimmune encephalitis or autoimmune neurology in general. Now, in 2016, there was a consensus criteria proposed that describes when to perhaps suspect a possible autoimmune encephalitis. And one of the characteristics is a subacute onset, so around three months of rapid progression of working memory deficits, altered mental status, or psychiatric symptoms. This, this would also include things like seizures. Now, a caveat to this is that some autoimmune conditions can present in a staggering, more chronic way, which could be more difficult to diagnose. Um, and we want to, with these conditions, at least see some central nervous system findings, whether they be exam findings, um, characteristic symptoms, or testing, ancillary testing, like we mentioned, showing some results. So for example, MRI suggesting encephalitis or the spinal fluid showing pleocytosis or abnormalities. The, one of the biggest things I still think though is number three here where it mentions reasonable exclusion of alternative causes. And that list is large. And I think, you know, if you add, you could always add things to that. So that's a very big um, point there. Some things that I forget to ask about in the history, even, even today, you know, are, are cancer risk factors. For example, um, smoking, uh, exposure to different agents, um, and then also family history is very important. So asking about conditions like vitiligo and thyroid conditions, which are often autoimmune, and the patients often don't volunteer these, these conditions if you just non-specifically ask about autoimmunity. Um, also, keep in mind dysautonomia, sleep and brainstem symptoms, and like I mentioned before, some of these conditions which are not immediately lethal may manifest over many years, actually, with a stuttering course. So with that, I'd like to start into a series of cases, video cases, and this is going to be a very much boots on the ground approach. And so I'm going to start both of these videos here and loop them. And I uh, just let me know if these are not coming across. So this is a this is a female with one month progressive ataxia, new. You, newly discovered uterine mass. Uh, many years ago, she had had breast cancer, which was determined to be uh, in remission, um, but now presented with one month of progressive ataxia and the uterine mass was found. And what you're seeing on the videos, first of all, on the left, 
it was a little more pronounced at the start, but she had a very wide based gait and obviously needs assistance there. So a very ataxic gait. On, on the right side, you're seeing ataxia as well in the upper extremities where the finger to nose to finger goes not in a straight line, rather way out and actually past the finger. So let's look at some of our diagnostics that we did at that point that I've highlighted here in red. Spinal fluid did show five oligoclonal bands, a marker of immune system activation in the spinal fluid. Uh, and specifically, it showed some of these perineoplastic autoantibodies, so anti-yo in high titers in both the serum and the spinal fluid. The MRI brain was not helpful. But like I said in the intro, the CT showed a uterine mass with multiple metastases. One of the metastases was biopsied and did show um, serous carcinoma of gynecological origin. Before we go more into this case, let's talk about a couple paradigms. So when screening for systemic malignancy, CT chest, abdomen, pelvis is a very good start. Um, but adding a metabolic imaging type or the PET can increase diagnostic yield by about 20%. And what's important to keep in mind that in some cases where perineoplastic conditions are strongly suspected, repeating imaging up to five years is helpful. This is just a slide I'll briefly show um, that shows skin cancer screening by imaging or exam findings. Um, and so the takeaway I would say from this is work with your radiology department. PET CT is quite good overall, but it does have its limitations. Um, and PET, the metabolic imaging type, because of the nonspecific nature, it, it can pick up a lot of background signal that you don't know quite what to do with. A lot of times we do see nonspecific adrenal um, adrenal uh, signal that is biopsied and is actually benign. So keys, keys to take away, it's a sensitive, but not necessarily a specific exam. Okay, next slide. Okay, so back to the patient. She came in with one to two months of um, ataxic symptoms. Her syndrome was recognized, especially after finding um, the cancer and immunotherapy, steroids, plasma exchange was given as along with early palliative chemotherapy. There was some improvement at that time. However, four months later, symptoms worsened and she was admitted again for treatments. IV methylprednisone and plasma exchange, which helped again somewhat. But again, two or three months later, things were overall going more downhill. And unfortunately, at that point, she elected, she, well, she elected for hospice due to symptom control and other, other factors. So this case represents anti yo uh, perineoplastic cerebellar degeneration. So this is a very dramatic subacute cerebellar involvement. In fact, this patient's course was, you know, about seven, eight, nine months. Um, the median time to survival was about 12 months, 12, 13 months. There have been no definite uh, reports of impact from immunomodulatory therapies when looking systematically. Now there are case reports certainly where this has happened but it raises the question, how do we effectively treat this? And the single most effective agent to treat this is treating the cancer, but what else can we do? So we know that Purkinje cells in the cerebellum are very um, susceptible to injury and death. And once they're dead, we don't get function back. So this raises the question of early intervention with immunotherapy on top of early chemotherapy. Could that be helpful? So this again highlights a need for more research into these perineoplastic conditions, which ironically were the first ones 
discovered, but now some of the research has tapered off. Let's go to case number two. 52 year old gentleman with multiple myeloma that was thought to be in remission presents with three weeks of headache, vision changes, and seizures. Spinal fluid showed a, something called matching bands, indicating possible systemic autoimmunity. And the EEG showed focal right slowing. So that is a somewhat specific uh, sign for brain dysfunction in a certain region of the brain. Looking at the brain MRI here, it is very impressive. So we have multifocal mass like non enhancing areas of cortical and subcortical T2 hyperintensity here, here, and here. And one might think that this is a little bit of an atypical picture for autoimmune encephalitis. However, this, this condition was recognized very promptly by the inpatient team as uh, autoimmune encephalitis. We'll get into the actual diagnosis in a second and received prompt immunotherapy listed below. So on the first image here, I will show you the initial brain MRI, just to scroll through. And then I want to show you three months later, the MRI on the very right here. So as you can see, I'll play that again on the right. It's a dramatic change in three months with immunotherapy. Okay, so this represents GABA-A receptor autoimmune encephalitis. And this case is somewhat unique in terms of radiographic findings. So the findings can be very, uh, very impressive, very tumefactive appearing. Um, fortunately, it has a very good response to immunotherapy. And what's paramount in this case is the early recognition, as well as testing spinal fluid and serum for GABA-A receptor encephalitis. A little nugget here is that this currently is only a research-based test, so you will need to get in touch with your research-based laboratories and coordinate testing of this. Okay, I'm gonna play this case. This is a case of a gentleman who presented with a neuroendocrine tumor, small bowel tumor, uh, with recurrence one year late, uh, two years later and resection after that, which was thought to be in remission after that point. In 2015, he develops a nonspecific twitching and tripping. Sometime thereafter, he had an insidious cognitive decline, but really things started up in August of 2020 when he had worsening choreathetoid movements, dystonia, which you see in the video here, these writhing, writhing movements. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Turns out, after we got more information, a PET screening exam of his body did show some nonspecific increased signal in chromogranin, which is a marker of neuroendocrine tumors had actually been increasing. MRI did not show anything specific at the time of evaluation 2020 in patient evaluation. However, a repeat PET CT did show hepatic metastases of likely the same process, which was going on six years prior. Um, spinal fluid and CSF were unremarkable. However, recognition that the subacute onset, or at least the subacute worsening of these symptoms in relation to cancer prompted immunotherapy, which did lead to a 40% improvement in symptoms. So this again represents acute on chronic stuttering course, which we need to be watching out for in a clinical based treatment for zero negative conditions. Okay, next case. So this is, this is truly a marathon session in diagnosis for this patient. So this, this woman presented with 15 years of visual findings, 
uh, 10 years of word finding difficulties, loss of time. And she had extensive testing over some 10 years with really not much helpful. Um, Meg or magnetoencephalography showed possible subtle epilepsy. However, this was never able to be confirmed by more conventional, more readily available techniques such as the EEGs. Um, there was maybe a hint of hypometabolism in the bilateral temporal lobes as well on SPECT. Here the video is playing. Over 10 years into the, this course, her feet began to have, especially her feet, increasing stiffness and cramping. So you see some cramping of the left foot here. We tested for common offenders like GAD65 and did a more broad workup, which was negative at that time as well. However, the field is moving at a blazing pace, like I've mentioned before, and new autoantibodies are always being discovered. So in this case, uh, the diagnosis was glycine receptor antibody-associated stiff person syndrome plus. And we, as part of our structural imaging, we got a PET scan, which did show um, hypermetabolism in the kind of central areas there, mediastinal areas, um, and other, other places. So autoimmunity, one thing about autoimmunity, it's a big family. It likes to stay together. And in this case, our updated diagnosis was glycine receptor positive uh, stiff person syndrome plus sarcoidosis. So this highlights a case of where we need to keep our differential and our working diagnosis open even over many, many years. And again, this is just one, one laboratory that has now commercialized a test. In glycine receptor in general, it predicts a potentially treatable stiff person spectrum of disease. So it's a useful biomarker. Now, what about infections in autoimmunity and autoimmune encephalitis? Well, certainly that's on the differential diagnosis for autoimmune encephalitis. Now, in this case, a 68-year-old gentleman had four years of behavioral changes, and two years after the onset of those was hospitalized for HSV or herpes encephalitis, treated adequately at that time. However, over the next year, there was a continuing decline. Um, in terms of personality, and when actually seen at the University of Utah, the exam showed myoclonus, perseveration, Parkinsonism, so definitely something was wrong. Now, imaging, a, a spinal fluid, first of all, did show 16 oligoclonal bands, so inflammatory activity in the spinal fluid, and MRI showed the previous area of HSV encephalitis, but possibly a hint also on the other side, on the left side of some changes in the medial temporal lobe as well. Now, the patient was empirically started on steroids, also received, I believe, one dose of rituximab, however, unfortunately um, died of a pulmonary embolism, which was thought unrelated to that. Autopsy did show, of the brain, showed uh, microglial activation in the hippocampus, uh, reactive lymphocytes, and gliosis in the hippocampus of the right, so scarring from the previous episode. Most importantly, though, there's no evidence of active viral infection or neurodegenerative pathology. So later, uh, or around this time, uh, the spinal fluid was also evaluated um, via screening method and did show an unclassified antibody. So while this represents a very serious case, we certainly do see cases like this of unclassified autoantibodies that have very good response to immunotherapy. So again, early recognition of the patient re or recognition of the symptoms and then recognition also that there is a very strong connection between infections and autoimmunity.
And one of the most clearly described um, situations is post-infectious NMDA receptor encephalitis, which may incur up to about a third of cases of HSV encephalitis within two months after treatment of that. And another fascinating thing I'd just like to quickly mention here is uh, multiple laboratories around the country and internationally, I'm sure, are looking more and more into metagenomic sequencing for infectious etiologies. Um, and this can be helpful in, in uh, chronic infections, et cetera. Now, now that we've got a couple cases of zero positive and zero negative, I'd like to ask you or like to present some questions of whether the next cases could be autoimmune encephalitis or something else. Case number one, this 64 year old gentleman with a history of prostate cancer in remission presents with three months of memory loss, sleep disturbance, gait instability, initially diagnosed as Parkinsonism or Parkinson's disease. On the CT chest, we see a small pulmonary nodule. Oh no, what do we do about that? Well, further, um, data comes in. We see some matching oligoclonal bands in the spinal fluid. It's minimally abnormal. MRI, however, shows something a little unexpected um, for potentially. So we see some T2 hyperintensities in the subcortical basal ganglia region here, but bilaterally. Uh, also with diffusion restriction in those same areas as well as the thalamus there. So this is actually a case of CJD or prion related disease and uh, RT quick CSF testing, which is specific and sensitive, did return positive um, sometime later. Okay, so this is CJD. Now I want you to parallel that three months of cognitive changes and Parkinsonism with this case. So this gentleman uh, in 2018 had a one hour quote unquote TIA mini stroke with memory loss. Okay, th that's a little weird for a TIA, but anyway, in 2019, one year later, he developed a slight tremor in his left hand, never presented to anybody, never thought it was significant. In October of 2020, he presented to us initially and with tremor and multifocal myoclonus outpatient. Uh, one month later, he was unable to walk, he had weight loss, memory problems, and then I saw him in December of 2020. Now he had severe myoclonic action tremor in the upper extremities, he had ocular, axial, appendicular ataxia with dysarthria, he was generally hyperreflexic, and he did have quite significant cognitive impairment at that time. Now, several MRIs over a two month period were unremarkable. EEG showed nonspecific findings. His sodium was slightly low, but the real kicker here is his spinal fluid, which was quite abnormal. 302 white cells, protein was minim or minimally to mildly elevated, and three restric restricted oligoclonal bands. PET did not show anything helpful. So in this case, he was very early given IV methylprednisone and he had a dramatic improvement even on the second day of IV methylprednisolone. This is personally not something that I see very often, such a dramatic improvement even on the second day um, because he was only up to about 60, 70% of baseline improvement after the IV methylprednisolone. Uh, we elected for plasma exchange and he was sent out on prednisone daily. At visit in clinic one month later after the hospital, he, had dram he was dramatically improved night and day, whereas he was previously unable to get up even out of bed due to severe uh, truncal ataxia. Now he could walk around even without a walker um, and things were really going quite well. So this represents a case of anti-GFAP astrocytopathy, a somewhat newly described uh, autoimmune condition. And this case, uh, actually, um, testing for CSF is much more sensitive than serum.
So indeed, that's what we saw as well. Our CSF studies showed positivity, whereas the serum did not. And this is what we call a meningomyelencephalitis um, or meningoencephalomyelitis. So it truly can involve the brain, the spine, um, and it can also involve the optic nerves. In this case, this patient presented, I would think, like a CJD-like picture. Now, case number three, this is a patient coming in with four or five days of confusion, so relatively rapid, um, and has right medial temporal lobe changes. However, there's something else also in the back there. Uh, testing the PET did not show or did show some nonspecific uh, areas which we biopsied were benign. And so the initial working diagnosis was autoimmune encephalitis and was given IV methylprednisolone. However, two months later, the MRI is looking quite a bit different. So this is a case of GBM actually. Now it turns out this is not an infrequent occurrence um, where GBMs can present similarly to autoimmune encephalitis. And so the key takeaway here is that you need to closely clinically and radiographically follow these individuals. Okay, so we're done with cases now, and I'd like to quickly mention a word about research. So this, this slide details specifically NMDA receptor encephalitis, but an important matter is looking in the long term. What happens with patients in the long term? And we now know that patients many times have these symptoms that can last for some time, and there can be a slow improvement. So what can we, what can we do maybe at the start to maybe help the long-term outcome. And so for NMDA receptor encephalitis, um, some things that have noted to confer a better or a poor prognosis rather is no treatment effect within four weeks of start of symptoms and no treatment within four weeks of the onset of symptoms. So really this argues for an aggressive early therapy and aggressive early escalation of therapy if no improvement even in the hospital. Um, early trials into the arena focused on LGI-1 Casper II related epilepsy and IVIG versus placebo. Now, this particular study had slow enrollment in 17 patients um, and was not statistically significant, but suggested that IVIG treated patients with LGI-1 Casper II epilepsy more often achieved greater than 50% reduction in seizure frequency, which is important to show um, because that opens up IVIG potentially to um, insurance approval for these conditions. Now, opening things up to prime time is a new trial that is a, a multi-center international trial uh, focusing on M NMDA receptor encephalitis. Um, and that is uh, this, what I have here to show to you. It's currently under review. Um, so I think there's a lot of excitement about this um, and, and we're hoping for really good in recruitment and really good exposure and uh, really looking forward to the results of this, this study. Now to, to finish things up a little bit, um, I wanna offer some tips for testing, laboratory testing of this condition. So in autoimmune encephalitis, you want to test the serum in the CSF. Now, the reason for this is we've already mentioned, for example, in GFAP uh, conditions, neuro neurological conditions, um, uh, CSF is very much more sensitive than, C uh, sorry, serum is very much more sensitive than, excuse me, CSF is very much more sensitive than serum. Um, and this, this is also similar in anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis where CSF is much more sensitive than, uh, and specific than serum as well. So we want to do panel-based testing because these conditions can also always have overlapping symptoms each. So you can't predict a single autoantibody based on symptoms. And you ideally would want to be in discussion with research based laboratories for tissue-based screening. And tissue-based screening allows you to discover 
uh, unclassified autoantibodies or yet undiscovered antibodies. So you're truly taking part in bench to bedside um, research and discovery in that way. So you should, like I said, contact your lab for additional specific research-based testing. Some of the additional ones that are not commonly uh, commercialized or not available commercially, um, GABA-A, um, only certain laboratories run, run MATA, et cetera. And so this is just one example of panel-based screening. So this is, a, in this case, a, excuse me, an autoimmune uh, encephalopathy panel that has many autoantibodies screened for, um, but not all. So not every panel is perfect. And at the core of screening or testing, laboratory testing, is that having a high pretest probability. So really kind of honing in on that diagnosis even before you start testing. And so thanks so much for listening to this presentation. Um, I have been fortunate and have the honor also to work with many lovely individuals at the University of Utah who have mentored me and uh, very, very happy to be able to work with them. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. So next up, I would like to introduce to everyone, Dr. Stanley Nates. Dr. Nates will be talking a little bit more about the laboratory techniques that can be used to diagnose these conditions. And also, uh, he will be talking about the interesting project where Euroimmune has uh, done research for decades to identify various unknown autoantibodies in these uh, autoimmune neurological conditions. So without further ado, um, Dr. Stanley Nades is a clinician scientist and a medical consultant. Dr. Nades is a board certified internist with subspeciality certification in rheumatology. In 2006, he joined the Quest Diagnostics Nicholas Institute as the medical director of the immunology R&D department. Here, he's focused on new assay development and oversight of reference laboratory clinical testing. Very recently, he was also the director of scientific affairs at Euroimmune US, where he oversaw collaboration, scientific communications, and uh, key publications. Thank you very much, Dr. Nates, for joining us today. Okay. Hello, everyone. I uh, wanted to follow up uh, Dr. Akashian's excellent uh, presentation with uh, a description of the methods that are used in the laboratory for detecting both intracellular and cell surface receptor antibodies. So just by uh, disclosure, um, these are my uh, consultations. So for this part of the presentation, we're going to talk about the methods used to detect antibodies targeting intracellular antigens, as well as those methods that are used for targeting cell surface receptors. And finally, we're going to talk about a very interesting, very exciting um, initiative within the Euroimmune um, research um, establishment to look for novel antibodies in autoimmune neurological disorders. And as we'll see, uh, these methods can be applied broadly. So as Dr. Uh, um, Kashin pointed out, the intracellular and extracellular antigens present different uh, pathogenesis um, in a neurological disease. So for intracellular antigens, these are typically antigens that are present within the cell and that are not exposed to the immune system until something bad happens to a cell. And that badness in many instances is due to a tumor in which the immune system responds as part of its duty of immune surveillance against the arising of such tumors and in the process become sensitized to proteins that may be in the tumor, for example, Hue in uh, small cell lung carcinoma cells. And now the immune system is primed to attack these wherever they may be found, including the brain. And so in this instance, the damage to the neural uh, cells 
are typically due to T cell effects with antibody serving as a biomarker of the disease, and in some cases may actually support T cell cytotoxicity in antibody dependent uh, cytotox uh, cell cytotoxicity. In contrast, when antibodies are made against cell surface or synaptic antigens, as may occur when perhaps a neuron is, is injured, as in a herpes simplex virus infection, the immune system is now primed to see components that may be in the neuron or on the neuronal surface. And in this instance, the antibodies modulate the receptor off the cell surface, decreasing um, um, receptor density and hence um, uh, causing dysfunction. The fact that the cell structure itself is intact um, and that the receptors may over time regenerate and improve their density once treatment has been effective ex helps explain why um, the uh, autoimmune encephalopathies due to antibodies targeting cell surface antigens are often uh, easier to treat. So in looking at a testing strategy, as um, Dr. Um, Kaddish has already um, pointed out, is typically a two-step strategy. The first is to screen for serum and, and CSF uh, for antibody on a wide variety of neurological a neural and non-neural uh, tissues looking for patterns of immunofluorescent staining. So typically what happens is that there's a cell substrate, um, the patient's serum or CSF is overlaid, what sticks sticks, what doesn't is washed off, and then a typically a goat um, antibody that has been raised against human immunoglobulin and that conjugate antibody, as it's called. Their second antibody has a fluorescein uh, label so that under the microscope, you can see fluorescent wherever the uh, patient's antibody has stuck. So you're able to look for patterns, both in terms of what tissues are affected and the structures within a given uh, tissue, within given cell. And then in confirming what is thought to be, uh, you know, one sees a pattern, there may be Different antibodies may give you the same pattern, um, or um, a particular antibody may give you, you know, um, it, it, one then looks to see what the specific antibody may be, and one confirms that using specific testing. Uh, the testing is typically done uh, as a membrane-based test, as an immunoblot, what we used to call Western blots, and now the improved version of a Western blot, the line blot, and uh, or um, one may take recombinant um, protein um, for the um, receptor or cell surface protein of interest, express it in a human embryonic kidney cells, HEC293 cells, and then do essentially a, an immunofluorescence, an indirect immunofluorescence on that. So using multiple tissues to do the initial scream uh, is very informative. So, for example, um, you know, HUE, uh, which Dr. Uh, Kaddish has already spoken of, um, can look very much like re-antibody in staining on cerebellum, but can be differentiated because HUE will stain the myenteric plexus, the autonomic uh, nerves in the small bowel wall. Similarly, amphiphysin and GAD65 stain very similarly in cerebellum and hippocampus and can be differentiated by the fact that GAD65 will stain the islet cells of the pancreas where amphiphysin does not. So this allows uh, an uh, multiple tissues allows you to identify pattern and suspected antibody that's responsible. So for many of the, many of the uh, intracellular um, antigens, uh, the next step in looking for monospecific confirmation is to do a, a line blot or Western blot. 
Now, the line blot represents a significant improvement over Western blots. Typical Western blot in this instance would be done by taking brain tissue, homogenizing it, running the proteolysate out on a polyacrylamide gel, and then transferring those proteins onto a filter paper by laying the filter paper over the gel. And then the filter paper is much easier to work with than what looks like jello, namely the gel. And so one can then cut the um, uh, filter paper into strips, put them into a well, add patient serum or CSF. If there are antibodies there, they'll glom on uh, to the protein, you wash it off, and then you come back with a second antibody, in this case, a goat anti-human uh, antibody that has attached to it, not fluorescine, but alkaline phosphatase, so that in the presence of peroxide, it will form a color reaction, and you can see a, um, a, a line on, on the blot. Now, the problem with Western blots is, one, you can't control for what pro how much protein of a given type you put on, and two, um, it becomes difficult to interpret sometimes because you, know, you may be looking for a protein that's a particular mo molecular weight, say 150 kilodaltons, because that's where you know where it runs in the gel. Uh, you have an approximation of where it should appear. But then again, there are other 150 kilodalton proteins that are in the brain, and there are other proteins that have similar molecular weight, maybe 148. And if they light up, it's very difficult to differentiate. So the improvement was the development of line blots in which a purified um, uh, antigen or recombinant antigen was spotted onto a filter paper, typically in a very small little chip, um, basically, that um, has been optimized that substrate, the paper has been chosen to optimally uh, adhere that particular protein, and you can control how much protein you actually put on the uh, filter so that you optimize its detection in your system. And then you take a whole number of different um, little paper chips, and you line them up on a plastic strip backing, and then you perform essentially the same activity you would for a Western blot. So that's an improvement which has been um, uh, you know, uh, uh, developed and um, enhanced by um, your immune very effectively. So when it comes to autoimmune encephalitis, and we're looking in particular for many of the um, cell surface antigens, we do that by placing uh, a recomp putting a recombinant uh, protein into a HEC293 cell and expressing it. And so we have cells that uh, express that specific um, protein, and that is our substrate. And what um, uh, Euromune has pioneered is to take these cells and put them on a glass cover slot slide, and there's some proprietary secret sauce in terms of how the cells are placed onto the slide such that there is a minimal um, fixation required. Um, the glue itself helps fix the cells and at the same time maintains the recombinant protein in the cell surface in its native form, in its native conformation. One of the things that one sees in the intracellular targets is that the immune system tends to see them after they have been processed and chewed up. So they tend to see segments of those proteins, and that allows you to look for antibodies that target um, a protein that has been somewhat denatured and when it's put onto a um, Western blot or line blot strip. In the case of the cell surface um, targets, they are required to have um, intact conformation. They work best when their conformation is presented in the context of a cell membrane. And so this is the advantage of using um, the cell-based assays. And what your immune has managed to do is to take the cells that are fixed on a glass cover slip and make small little chips of them 
and place multiple chips into a single well so that it becomes possible to test multiple um, multiple antibodies simultaneously within the same well, and they provide um, internal controls so that you know that if, for example, the NMDAR1 uh, substrate stains, but CASPER2 doesn't, AMPAR12 doesn't, LGI1, and so on, then indeed this is specific for NMDAR1 staining. So both the tissue and the cell-based mosaic um, slides can be fully automated um, and uh, in terms of slide preparation. And more importantly, they can be automated in terms of image acquisition. Um, obviously, the tissues are pre-selected during the manufacturing process so that the quality of the uh, substrate and the resulting images are, are quite good. The other advantage of having automated image acquisition is that the images are presented up on the computer screen. This takes the technologist out of the dark room. Um, and it also enhances education and training because you know, I think many of us have had the experience of sitting at a microscope, seeing something and asking about what you know, a supervisor or what others may think, or you're trying to, you know, teach and you're, you look at and see a structure, and then you have to back away from the microscope and ask someone else to look and try to describe what you were looking at because they are looking at it in isolation. But with the um, uh, Euro pattern uh, um, platform, you're able to put these images up on the screen. You can actually archive them so you can come back later and use them for teaching or, or uh, education or consultation. And you can stand there and point to the screen and all agree that you're looking at the same thing. So there's a great deal of advantage in, in using those materials. So your immune has been a leader in neuroimmunology because of its active role in research and development led by the Institute of Experimental Immunology. This is a group of over 70 scientists who um, are actively involved in identifying new antigens. And so, for example, they've identified unknown neur neuronal antigens such as ATP1A3 and ITPR1. And so they have added to the armamentarium that the clinician has available. They've also been very active in bringing uh, discoveries of others such as NMDAR1 by Dr. Dalmar, by bringing it to the commercial market, by creating recombinant cell-based assays and allowing um, these uh, antibodies to be tested uh, in commercial laboratories, providing more access to patients. And at the same time, there have been instances where they've gone on to uh, improve antigens above what they appear as their natural state, such as glioacidic uh, filament uh, protein, where a designer antigen has been made, coupling uh, several um, molecules together in order to enhance sensitivity in the assay. So a number of different approaches to uh, assisting the field. So one of the things that um, uh, your immune uh, is, is most proud about uh, is because it's a discovery uh, process. And that is what we've affectionately called our UFO project. This is our unknown fluorescence object. Your immune has, in addition to its manufacturing capabilities, a very active uh, reference laboratory. And in that laboratory or um, from outside uh, laboratories where individuals may see a pattern um, that does not confirm or see an unusual pattern that they have not seen before, there's an opportunity to explore what that antibody may be recognizing. And so, for example, you know, when one sees a, a GAD pattern on tissue and it's confirmed GAD, one's happy. Same thing for a GABA B receptor, uh, one's happy. But if you see a novel fluorescent pattern, or a pattern that looks like one you've seen before, 
but does not have confirmation that it is the suspected specific antibody, that specimen becomes a candidate for the UFO project. Next slide. And what the UFO project does is it takes a brain and homogenizes it, and makes a lysate, and then it takes the patient serum or CSF and mixes that in with the lysate. The antibodies that are present in the patient's serum or CSF will then complex with its antigenic target, forming immune complexes. And then using a method that is very common in immunology to precipitate immune complexes, one can then add um, magnetic beads that are coated with protein G. Protein G will um, interact with immunoglobulin and pull down the um, uh, beads. You wash everything else off, um, and then you take your... Um, your beads and elute the uh, proteins off, run it in a polyacrylamide gel, stain it, and then look for um, uh, proteins that um, were um, appear novel and run them in mass spec, maldi tof to identify what the protein is. So that is uh, your typical UFO project. Um, you can also look cryo sections instead of whole brain and, and isolate bits of tissue and do the same process where you add the patient serum or CSF, uh, form immune complexes, precipitate and spin down the immune complexes by ultracentrifugation, getting rid of the non-binding antibodies, and then add the uh, protein-coated uh, magnetic beads and follow through. Next slide. So the UFO target identification project has, has identified any of a number of novel um, targets um, that are making or have made their way into the um, commercial space. So flotilla one and two, for example, which has been associated with multiple sclerosis. ITPR1, which is associated with cellular ataxia and tumor. It's a, a Purkinje cell uh, target. R gap 26, also cerebellar ataxia, typically with tumor, another Purkinje cell target, neurochondrin, NF and STX1B, the latter two associated with movement disorders. Now, this approach has also been applied in the area of rheumatology because many of us are well aware that we do anti-nuclear antibodies. These are um, typically uh, not neuronal specific. Um, these are the kinds of anti-nuclear antibodies your rheumatologists would look for in lupus, in scleroderma, and a whole host of other uh, autoimmune diseases. And they have found using this approach a number of different markers. And these are markers that um, represent um, proteins um, that are involved in regulation of nucleic acids and transcriptional regulations, such as uh, pole R2A, uh, which is an RNA polymerase, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and so on. So there have been a number of targets that have been identified. And so this project not only provides um, new potential targets, um, but also uh, provides insights into how uh, the immune system works, how cells work in, in the neurology sphere, um, how uh, central nervous system works by um, looking at these, if you will, experiments in nature. Next slide. So, you know, that contribution to the market has been um, a tradition uh, over the last uh, 14 years at uh, Euromune, uh, beginning in the neurology space with uh, in licensing of Dr. Dalmar's NMDAR discovery, and then subsequently other discoveries, GABA B uh, receptor, LGI1, Casper2, uh, Aquaporin4, Ampar, and so on. So there's been a long line and tradition of 
of in licensing as well as internal discovery, uh, which uh, your has placed your immune um, uh, in a very um, leadership role in in the area, particularly in neurology. So as we think about um, autoantibody pattern. Panels. I think uh, Dr. Kaddish uh, very aptly pointed out that um, many, you know, a given syndrome, a given uh, clinical presentation may be caused by any of a number of different antibodies, and a given antibody may have a number of different presentations. For example, Q uh, may present with cerebellar degeneration as well as peripheral neuropathy. And it becomes very important because you know, we're looking at many potentially different antibodies in a screen. You need to know your lab and you need to know what antibodies they are testing and what methods they use because the methods may actually impact on how you need to interpret results and um, what kinds of results you, you might get. So it's important in a panel to always know what's tested, what's reflexed and when and uh, recognize that clinically relative positive antibodies may be found when they were not necessarily ordered. Um, Doctor, uh, uh, you know, the folks at um, Euromune uh, did a study back in 2015 in which they looked at all of the specimens sent to the reference lab over 16,000 over a period of time and uh, asked um, what was ordered um, and then uh, tested those specimens for everything else they had, everything that was commercially available as well as um, antibodies that were in the uh, R&D pipeline. And in the course of that study, it turned out that about 53% uh, of the time when there was a positive, 53% of the time it was positive for what the clinician had requested. And 47% of the time when it was positive, it was for something other than what the clinician uh, had requested. Re now, recognizing that at that time, about 22% of the, of the positives were for antibodies that were not widely commercially available. And there was another 13% at the time that had positive indirect immunofluorescence but did not have a specific antibody identified. So again, UFO candidates. So again, um, you know, know your lab. It becomes very important in helping you um, on the clinical side. And with that, um, I'm happy to uh, join Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Kaddish to uh, take questions. Okay, and thank you everyone for attending the webinar. So I've compiled a list of questions so far. So uh, the question was, can you suspect autoimmune encephalitis after COVID-19 viral infection? And if so, which autoantibody could be involved? So for the first part, absolutely. Um, for the second part, we both, I and Dr. Nades kind of discuss that it's difficult to predict. Um, unless you have a very pathognomonic presentation such as uh, facio-brachodystonic seizures, you know, it's otherwise quite difficult to base off clinical criteria predict. So we would go back to the broad uh, penal-based testing and, and screening. Perfect, thank you. And uh, Dr. Nates, this question is for you from Marie Cairo. Uh, are you aware of any UFO findings that could even remotely be seen as related to Hashimoto's encephalitis? Um. <laughs> Not offhand. But then again, the scientists don't tell me everything that they're doing <laughs> until they secure the intellectual properties. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Kaddish, this question is from Isa Engen. Uh, what should we consider clinically for ANA and ANNA uh, positive patients? Clinically, you're, you would present with, uh, you know, it could be it could be different things. It could be a limbic encephalitis. It could be a spinal cord or a kind of neuronopathy-like syndrome. Um, the big association there is with lung cancer, um, so that should aggressively be sought out um, if in, in, if there is anti-HUD positivity. Okay.
Uh, next question is from uh, Dr. Nave. Did you have something to add? Yeah, I, I, you know, um, um, Posner's and Dornell's text monograph on uh, perineoplastic syndromes points out a number of cases in which individuals presented with, for example, Hugh, um, have had an extensive workup um, for lung cancer. And um, then, um, you know, you never, f and then if the individual would come to autopsy, would have the lung examined and carefully examined uh, in section, looking for tumor. And in, in, in some of those cases, they find a small nidus, a small little spot of cancer, and in some cases they don't. So it would suggest to me that the immune system has been very effective in those instances of doing what it's supposed to do, and that's immune surveillance, so that when a tumor arises, it attacks it, kills it. At the same time, the, down, you know, the collateral damage then becomes development of an autoantibody that can affect such an immune system. Yeah. And just to quickly add to anti-Hue, um, some underrecognized symptoms also include GI symptoms, so bowel perforation, dysmotility syndromes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kaddish and Dr. Nades. And, and just, and just to reiterate, you know, to <laughs> underscore the clinical um, aspect is that when you look for Hue, you're looking for staining of the myenteric plexus, mm -hmm. the autonomic control centers in the small bowel as well. So, you know, the laboratory and the clinical picture. Uh, okay. Uh, this next question is from Shirazade Lay. Um, how do, and for Dr. Kaddish, uh, how do you decide dosing for rituximab? There is variability in the literature, 1,000 milligrams every six months or 2,000 every six months. Do you decide based on the T and B lymphocyte subset with level of CD19 repopulation? So there is not a great evidence basis for this. I'll be the first to admit. Um, a lot of times uh, severity of the condition and chance to relapse and affect key neurological structures like the brain stem, et cetera, um, pushes us to throw more upfront. Um, so, there's not a, I don't have a great answer for you, but one analogy I do have is the difference between using rituximab and MS versus NMO, where more frequently individuals will use higher doses in NMO, 2, 000, uh, two grams every six months versus perhaps one gram or less in MS. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, this question is for uh, Dr. Nades from Jody. Uh, how can patients better advocate when they are initially seronegative and doctors refuse to refer patients to psychological, psychological care instead of neuro neurological care, especially since early treatment improves outcome, even when there is clinical and testing evidence such as EEG slowing, ataxia, and et cetera? Um, as a clinician, I've often said that uh, I work for the patient. Um, they can hire me and they can fire me. They can also go for a second opinion and, and I'm always happy to see them again afterwards. Um, and I would encourage uh, patients to advocate for themselves and, and have a, a frank discussion with their clinicians. Um, if they feel that there is more that can be done, um, then there are um, and Dr. Kaddish uh, is a very fine example, a number of neurologists throughout the country that have been trained and are actively involved in the care of patients with uh, autoimmune neurological disease. And certainly a referral to um, such uh, a practitioner um, would not be out of, out of order um, if someone felt that uh, their concerns were not being properly addressed. Perfect, thank you. And I know we are a little bit out of time. I will answer two more questions. Can and I, can if, I, sorry, yeah. sorry, I interrupt. Can I take one moment to answer something there? Please. Um, in regards to finishing what Dr. Nades was saying, referring to a center with expertise is very important. Uh, looking at the Autoimmune Encephalitis Alliance for such centers is a good way for patients to get in touch and contact with those. Sorry about that. No, you're totally fine. Thank you. Very good. Okay, um, this question is from Bernali. 
in pediatric multi-system inflammatory syndrome associated with COVID-19, such as Kawasaki-like disease, should we search for autoimmune association? And if yes, do you suggest any specific profile? There. There, there are a number of, um, of parameters that one looks at. These are um, very much, in some respects, similar in presentation to macrophage activation syndrome, in which basically uh, the individual is suffering a cytokine storm. So there are a number of, of parameters that one looks at, a number of cytokines one can look at to help in that diagnosis. But awesome. this is an area of active investigation. I mean, obviously, it's a relatively new syndrome. Definitely. Thank you. Okay, uh, last question uh, for either Dr. Kaddish or Dr. Nage. Um, from Jerome Chin and also the similar question from Stephen Swapley. Uh, how would you advise clinicians in countries where antibody panel testing is not available or not affordable on empirical treatment or suspected autoimmune encephalitis? Okay. So I would go back to the mentioned clinical criteria. So 2016 Grouse et al. Um, devised the, the clinical toolkit slide that I had up earlier. Um, and so when you have subacute neurological uh, issues, especially encephalopathy, seizures, in many cases, these seizures will be refractory to anti-epileptic treatments. When you have movement disorders, sleep, sleep disorders that happen along with that, uh, and usually these are progressive conditions, then those are some of the issues that would raise concern for an autoimmune neurological condition or autoimmune encephalitis. And so empiric treatment is really the key at that point um, if you're not able to um, kind of get the, get the laboratory tests and then also following these patients very closely clinically um, with the different diagnostics as well as neuropsychological testing, for example. And, and I would add that if you're in an area that is underserved with respect to lab resources, um, you could try reaching out to a number of, of key opinion leaders in the field who have active research laboratories who uh, may be able to uh, help. Perfect, thank you. And uh, we have a question from uh, Mariam Khalil Salami. Uh, what is the benefit to test autoantibodies in CSF if they are already positive in serum? Well, I think obviously serum is an easier um, uh, an easier uh, sample type to obtain. Um, and um, you know if you have an antibody that's present in the serum, um, it's uh, you know you can be confident uh, with your more confident with your diagnosis given that it fits with everything else uh, that, that patient presentation as well as uh, imaging and other laboratory findings um, there are instances uh, where um, you know it's reassuring to know that it's also present in the csf uh, gives you a little more confidence i would think uh, dr kaddish uh, you may want to weigh in on that one yeah, and I would say it depends from antibody to antibody. Uh, some things that are more sensitive in the serum are anti-NMDA receptor, anti-GFAP, um, LGI-1 is more sensitive in the serum. What you have to consider when you have a serum sample, again, goes back to knowing your test. So in other words, what titer is it? Um, and oftentimes in the serum, you know, this is where most of our antibodies are normally, right? So you can have a lot of non-specific antibody signals, which may not be directly relatable to the neurological condition. So in, in, some, in generally, I would say CSF testing uh, can provide more specificity, although this does vary from antibody to antibody. Perfect, okay, and uh, we'll take one more question here from Eliza maldonado Holmerts. Uh, she says, I have several antibodies in CSF and serum, but was told none of them are significantly high and therefore seronegative. Um, do you have any perspective on why that would be? Again, I think it would depend on what antibodies are being found and what they're referring to. Um, 
you know, there there certainly are, you know, we see in serum antibodies uh, to a number of things. We see anti-nuclear antibodies that are not neuronal specific. Uh, they tend not to be in CSF. Um, but again, uh, it would be a question of the specific, the devil's in the, the details in that instance. And just to, I, I would quickly add uh, with an example of GAD65 and neurological sim- syndromes that may pertain to that. Um, low levels, especially in the serum, may be related to underlying autoimmunity, for example, type 1 diabetes, um, thyroid conditions, etc. And so the titer there has been uh, shown to be important. Usually, uh, CNS specific titers can be 1,000 times the upper level of normal just to give you an idea. Awesome. And, and, and that just underscores the importance of knowing how your lab is doing testing, because if the lab is doing testing with the routine GAD65 that's used for diabetes immunity, um, you look at a positive um, that um, when tested, for example, on a Euromune Western blot strip uh, would be negative because they are um, developed to put the positives into that high tighter range. Perfect. And we'll end on this question. Uh, speaking of labs, how important is it to have a tighter rather than just a positive or negative negative result? And this question is from Lisa Peterson. Well, I, I, I would say that, you know, most physicians would say the higher, the tighter, the more confident you are in the diagnosis, but also it gives you something to follow. Dr. Kaddish? Yeah, well, you know, going with the GAD65 example, I do think there's merit in that case, although following titers over time can get you in a tricky and sticky situation. So it's not an absolute, but in certain cases, for example, GAD65 neurological conditions, it has been documented for certain assay types uh, to lead to a more confident diagnosis. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for your questions. We did get uh, quite a few questions, over um, 30 or 40 questions. If your question was not answered during the panel discussion, we will definitely be emailing you uh, with the response from Dr. Kaddish or Dr. Nades. And at this time, I'll go ahead and uh, leave the chat box open for a few more minutes if you do have any additional questions. Uh, Thank you again for your support, and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.